Good day, lords and ladies, and welcome to Crusader Kings 3 with me, Cornus Knight. Crusader Kings 3 is a game developed by Paradox Studios and one of my favourite game series of all time. Um, it is a grand strategy game with heavy role-playing elements. And uh, the current title, num the number three in the title of the series, has not fallen sort of that expectation. They've enhanced the role-playing elements of it to a lot, to a large degree. As you can see here, this is the character we'll be playing in the game. Um, in the Petty Kingdom of Cornwall, we will be playing um, King Dumnarth the Second. And once he dies, we'll be playing as his son, because you play as the head of the dynasty. I will explain more about the mechanics of the game once we get into it. It is a grand strategy game, so there is a, bit, a little bit of learning that will come with it. But it's relatively straightforward to learn this title, so let's dive straight in. Welcome to the world of Crusader Kings. It is 8 67 AD, the 1st of January. The game ends, I believe, 400 and... I think it's 450. Um, 450, around that mark. Um, actually, there's a really easy way we can tell. If we pause the game, and we go to the achievement section, um, and we go possible achievements, which are the ones we haven't unlocked yet, and we scroll down, I believe... Yeah, there we go. 1453, an end of an era, which is when the game ends. Um, I am carrying, currently playing on the Iron Man mode to get achievements unlocked. And the game is currently paused. Now, this before we go any further, this is the world. It is very, very beautiful, very colourful, very dynamic, and there's lots of information and stuff about it. But to be honest, most of the information is you don't really need to know. Um starting off the back so we will just quickly cover the basics which is that we'll start at the top and we will work our way down um, at the top here you see we have our notification icons um, which just tell you the basic information you need to know like uh, stuff like lifestyles which is um, a focus for your character which we'll get into a bit more later on like you can get married you can declare wars and various bits and pieces but this is all just stuff we will cover a bit later on up here is your resources for the game like any kind of grand strategy game in the paradox series like stellaris or europa universalis or hearts fine you have resources you have money which is used to basically buy improvements in your kingdom and to pay for your armies uh, you have prestige which is your characters which is this gentleman down here um, your character's level of fame or infamy if you want to think of it like that and it is used for predominantly interacting with events and declaring certain types of wars um, also you can use it to pay for various units of troops and bits and pieces um, but we get into, the, into that later um, your level of fame, or well, your level of prestige, basically um, gives you some benefits, which we'll cover later on as well. Here is your piety. This is how religiously pious you are to your religion. We are Catholic, as you can see down here, um, which we'll go into a bit later on. Being a member of the Catholic faith gives us certain boons and certain restrictions. Um, the higher our level of piety, as you can see here, we are currently dutiful. The next level is faithful. Um, that will have an impact upon how certain religious characters in the world will see us, like the Pope and our bishops and various bits and pieces. You can also use piety to uh, declare religious wars, because you wouldn't be playing a medieval simulation game if you couldn't declare religious wars on people. Um, then you have your renown, which is the prestige of your dynasty. We are a member of the House of Kernu. Um, which basically we have a current level of reputable with our fame. As you can see here, we are a reputable house, um, which means that people who, all the children of our dynasty start off with 400 prestige as standard. If people marrying into our dynasty gain an additional 300 prestige because we are a, a reputable dynasty to be, a reputable family to be part of. Um, and we get a bonus for having a long rule. Um, 
and once uh, we get enough renown, you can spend your renown points on doing certain actions, but then again, we will cover that a bit later. Here are our amount of troops. We have a decent quality of troops. We have our basic levies, which are our militia, like our, our peasant foot soldiers and our knights. Um, here we have our dominions, which are territory that we can personally control with our character. Your character only has so much time and energy, he can only focus on governing so many regions. If you go over that limit, you will start suffering negative returns, both from popularity within those regions and what you get out of them and how people view your character. Though that is the resources. Down this side is relative information to do with your kingdom and your court that are split in two as you can see on this line. This is your relative kingdom information and here is your court information. Um, so let's start here. You have the realm which is divided up into three categories which is your dominions which are basically the territories that you directly own so we earl own the earl of devon and the earl of cornwall or the earldom of devon and the earldom of cornwall um it still knocks me that the capital of the petty kingdom of cornwall is in devon as a cornishman i find that grievously offensive um then you have direct vassals like your followers under our control we only have one at the moment which is our spy master um, and then the succession, which is that, as it currently stands with our current law, which is confederated partition, which is basically how the succession of the kingdom will play out. You only have one son at the moment, which means he will inherit everything. If we had more children, that would be different. The territories would be split up amongst them. If we had different gender laws, at the moment it's male preference. For example... Um, it means basically all male children get preference over female children. Certain cultures and religions give you differences to that and you can unlock laws which change it. For those of you who are interested, I have currently have it set in the, in the um, options menu that when we have a pop-up menu, you can press this button. I press the middle mouse button to, to keep this window popped up and you can hover over it and you have more information. And if you want to see more information, you can then press the tab again, the middle mouse button again. Come on. Yeah, sometimes it does it, sometimes it doesn't. It's annoying. There we go. Um, and you can get additional information up. Which is, this game is very straightforward. There's a lot of easily accessible information that if you just had time, you can sit through and read. I would also recommend um, playing the tutorial, um, the tutorial campaign which really helps new players get into the franchise. But we are getting distracted. That is our council. You also have crown authority, which is how you directly govern your kingdom. Um, but we shall go into that a bit later on. Basically, the higher the level of it, the more you get out of your kingdom as a character. So you get more money and more troops and more influence. But the downside is your subjects become more agitated towards you as your level of central control goes up. With that done, we will look at, you can then have the military tab for your kingdom. As I said, this is the overview of our military. We have our levy forces, which are relatively weak, um, not particularly impressive, and they're just there for numbers. You have your knights, which are your elite fighting forces in your army, and they have individual prowess, which is uh, used to determine how many casualties they inflict upon the enemy. Um, and then you have... Uh, men at arm regiments which are your professional military regiments your dedicated soldiers like you have your light footmen your bowmen your horses your pikemen your armored footmen and other units that will come become unlocked once you research certain cultural technologies you can either also hire mercenaries we won't really touch on that for now you can also hire religious orders um, but we will not touch on that for now because no one in the world has created them yet in, our, in the Catholic faith, at any rate. With the military stuff out of the way, we shall have a quick look at the council. These are the five pe these are the five direct vassals under your direct subordinates under you to help you assist you with ruling your realm. Um, they each have each character in this world has six stats. Oh, sorry, five stats. Um, well, six if you count prowess, which is your melee ability. Um, but these five stats determine 
your effectiveness at certain areas, for example, a character that's very good at diplomacy can get on with other characters in the world. Like they, people will like him more. He's better at persuading people to do things, um, and it, it's you can. It's basically how charming you are. A character that's got, for example, good stewardship can hold more territory because he's better at administration. He will get more money out of his territory. A character that's better at martial can have more troops because he's better at organizing the army and leading them in battle. So he'll be better in combat. Um, like as a general, someone who's good at intrigue is basically your traditional sort of cloak and dagger spy master, like Machiavellian schemer that can kidnap and assassinate and and coerce and blackmail people into doing what he wishes. And someone who's good at learning, good at the learning trade, for example, will be better at researching technology, having the church and religious figures on your side, teaching children, teaching your children like beneficial traits, helping raise up the next generation, and um, finding out interesting information through non-evil sources. This square here is always occupied by your wife. And your wife can help you with, or your husband if you're playing a female character, can help you give you beneficial stats. Um, so if we look at our character, he is, let's see, he is average at diplomacy. He's not particularly good at martial. He's poor at stewardship. He's terrible at intrigue. But he's average at learning. So across the board, not great, but not bad either. So... He's also an honest, gracious um, individual. He's chaste, which means that he dislikes intimate contact. He's a bit shy, which means that our chance of having children will go down. Um, but we we'll get into those details in a second. Since we've cleared out, the, since we've covered the uh, government information, like the kingdom information, we'll look at the court. Here in the court, we have everybody who's in our court. So we have our children. We have. The relatives that are linked to us, for example, our nephew, our half-brother, these are everybody that li that's inside our court and who is not in anybody else's court, like one of our retainers. We can also hire a doctor. So, for example, if we wanted to hire a doctor, we could press this button to look for someone in the kingdom or we just look for someone in the kingdom that has high intelligence like this lady here and we can go, yeah, I, I like the look of her. We can appoint her as our doctor, our court physician, so when people get sick... Um, so we'll basically tend to them. See it here. Court position. The court position is responsible for the health and well-being of your court. They are in. They will treat diseases and suit to wounds, alleviating the negative effects um, such as pneumonia or wounded traits that you can pick up from events or from being in combat. Here we have the intrigue bar, which is any hostile schemes we are trying to concoct, any personal schemes like trying to seduce people we are trying to concoct, or any schemes that we are, have discovered that are being acted against us. Here is all the secrets and hooks, which are basically like blackmail material that you have. We have one on our son because he is our son, so we can influence him. And we don't know anything else. We ourselves can also have secrets. So like if we murder people, if we seduce people, if we are a heretic, if we are a witch, if we are a cannibal, there's a whole host of secrets you can have in this game that can people can find out and use against you. Here are factions. Factions develop against you for a multitude of reasons, be it a peasant faction which basically wants more independence or wants to be independent from your government, or it could be your own retainers plotting against you um, and are out to change things, maybe put someone new on the throne or maybe make themselves king. Here in decisions, which are events that happen in your realm. These are major decisions. Most of these can only happen once per game. So we can only really form like one holy order once per game. We can do stuff like find a new kingdom, restore the kingdom of Cornwall, which is a special event linked to us. Most countries will have a special major decision linked to that country. For example, um, Ireland, if you form the Kingdom of Ireland, you have a special major decision to form the Tannery, which is their unique form of government. We can restore the Holy Roman Empire. I'm pretty sure nearly every Catholic faction in the game gets this. Um, but that's be as it may. Like, and then you have decisions that are repeated, normal decisions which are repeated throughout your kingdom. So we can go on pilgrimage, we can invite someone to our kingdom 
um, which has a, a claim on another kingdom nearby which we could exploit. We can invite knights, which basically improve the quality of our army. We can go on hold feasts and go on the hunt, on go on a hunt, which will give us more prestige and help us release stress, which is a which is a stat that affects our character's well-being. We can also search for like a position. There are other decisions that pop up, which become unlocked later on due to certain factors, which we'll cover now. Um, with that out of the way here, and that's the that's the the world information, like the resources and your and information for your court done with your character. Your character basically has five stats, as I have gone over already. He has Diplomacy, Martial, Stewardship, Intrigue, and Learning. Each of these five stats has their own focus, which is here, Lifestyles. There are five Lifestyles, each one associated with one particular stat. And in each, for example, let's have a look at Martial. He is leaning towards the Martial Tree. So if we went into the Martial Tree, because he has training in it, you'll get a bonus to learning in that tree. So, if we look here, um, you have three trees that you can choose from for the martial, martial lifestyle. Um, he's mostly gone down the overseer route, which means that at the end of it, he can pick up the overseer trait, which basically gives him plus to martial, plus to stewardship, plus to control, which is basically your control of the territory you control. So for now, we will, let's go with a strategy focus, which will boost our martial skill up by three points and give us more martial experience every month. You get it at the end of every month, this bar will fill up. Once it fills up to a thousand, you get another experience perk. So let's select that. And that will slowly start ticking away once we start the game. There are others such as stewardship, intrigue, learning and they all are very unique to themselves and impact the world in different ways so you can very much tailor and play your character exactly how you wish um and down down here as we said we have our character we have the duchies that he controls the territory he directly controls we have his family members like both living and dead his current children his siblings um, he has other traits, so this is his education. He's got a misguided warrior, which means he has a slight bonus to ma martial skill. Um, but that's about it. He's also reckless, which means that that will affect combat if he's fighting in combat. Um, down here we have the kill. Basically, if you click this button, you go right back to your kingdom. Here we have the lifestyle focus. This is the stress bar. Doing actions which are against your character's nature. For example, he is honest, so if we try to do a deceitful action like lie or blackmail someone, we will take stress, and once this bar fills up, we get a level of stress, which will have negative consequences. So you really want to role-play your character, um, and it, it, the game gives you incentives for role-playing your character. You get bonuses from playing to your character's strengths. Um, here we have our family, the uh, house canoe. As you can see, um, with our motto "Triumph and Industry," you can also edit this. It's complete ability to rename your house and rename your motto. Um, this is your dynasty. We currently have four living members. Um, as time goes on, you can have more mem more branch houses of this dynasty develop, and it will help you get more renown. And then renown is spent on various bits and pieces down here, but we won't really cover that right now. Then we have the Catholic faith, we have Catholicism. These are the traits which are dominant within our faith. Um, we basically, if we go on pilgrimages, we get bonuses to that. We get communions, characters can seek indulgences from the head of the faith, which will basically give us various bits and pieces. Um, Cordis can take the vow of becoming a monk, which will basically give us virtues and various bits and pieces of that. Um, we are a male-dominated religion. We are righteous. We are theocratic which means basically temple holdings are leased out to the holder's realm priest who then serve them as a, a phreatic vassal. And then we have this other Christian face have the immense doctrine consider Astray instead of hostile. So basically, um, other sects of Christianity we won't see as hostile. We have the Pope as the head of our religion. There are certain traits which we see as sinful, which will give us negative piety, and there are certain traits which are virtuous, which will give us positive piety. 
Um, but that's generally all we need to know for now. Um, I know it seems like a lot of information, but it's not. It's very straightforward once you get into it. And as I suggest, you play the tutorial. Island is a good place to learn how to play the game. Um, but I have spent enough time explaining mechanics, so let us dive right in. One last thing is culture, which is how we research stuff. As the head of our culture, um, because we are the Colonist culture group, we can basically dictate what we learn. So, for example, I want us to focus on, let's see, gavel kind, which is basically our inheritance laws, who inherits what. So, let's focus on that for the moment. Um, yes, that sounds like a good idea. So, we have that done. So, that's what we're going to be focusing on. We will be playing the game at slow speed um, to start off with. And let us just get everything else set up. Our, our ruler isn't currently married. So, let's find someone to marry him. With this bar, you can select what focus the partner is. Like, do you want to have a marriage with someone who has a strong alliance, which gives you a strong alliance? Someone who gives you a lot of prestige? Um, there's a whole host of things you can do. Um, you can also filter out information like religion, culture, age, all this kind of stuff. Let's go with alliance power for now. And we will go to pick a wife. Ooh, we can marry into the kingdom of West France here. Um, who do we want to marry? There's f he's, he's got four daughters. None of them are particularly outstanding. Um... If you could marry, let's see. Man, none of them are particularly good. Let's grab her. So we get a nice bunch of fame. Well, prestige for marrying into our ha into her house because we are marrying upwards because he is a king and we are a petty king. And um, she gets plus 300 prestige because she's marrying to our family. If we had information like used against her, we could try and use a hook to force some stuff through. We could also do a maternal marriage, which basically means her bloodline takes dominance over ours. But for now, let's take a simple marriage to her. That is all done. Um, we could ask our head of faith for monies, which is probably be a good idea, to be honest, because we're a bit low on cash. He likes us quite a bit, but this would take away most of our opinion from him. And let's just let time tick on. We're doing it at a slow speed. Um, we could fabricate a claim. We could declare war. Ah, excellent. So this has gone through. We get a bit of money. We are now married. Excellent. Now, we can declare war. This is how you declare war. You can click on any country in the world. Well, not every country in the world, but nearby countries, realistically speaking. So we're going to click on Leon. Or Leon. Um, and Count Olafar of Leon is in current command of this ter territory. He is a pagan, though. He is basically someone f he is following he's Norse and he's following basically the Norse faith so we can declare a holy war against him from control so let's go declare a holy war for the county of Lyon which will cost us 80 piety which is most of our remaining piety um, so let's do that he has a vastly inferior military compared to us and he doesn't have enough money to hire mercenaries so we'll declare war we shall raise our armies, which always raises where you have this flag. So let's redeploy it, redeploy it to Launston. We will um, raise all our armies up. And they rally themselves to the field of combat. And we shall sail across the sea to invade Brittany. Um, it will cost us 8 gold to get our armed forces across the channel. We do have an ally in France we could call on, but it is overkill. He doesn't have a lot of troops. He has 200, so we outnumber him. And I think it's unnecessary to call in so many, to call in favours right now. It will also cost us prestige to call in allies, since you are asking for help, so you are losing face, as it, as it were. You are being, you are having to embarrass yourself to call in allies. So let's to drop our soldiers off. He's already rallying his troops to his banner. So now we're here. We're going to drop the speed back down to one. As you can see here, there is a penalty. 
recently um, disembarked, which will basically affect our effectiveness in combat. So if we just have this tab open here, yeah, an army will become recently disembarked when it has disembarked from the sea. This will cause the army to suffer advantage penalties in battle, which basically means we will be worse in combat a lot, uh, significantly worse in combat the longer this thing is around. So we're going to want to burn this off. So we're going to pop up the speed two, which will burn through this counter here. All the time we're doing this, as you can see, we are spending money. Because having our troops raised costs us cash. Because we have to pay our men, pay our supplies, all that jazz. Right, that is gone. Let us start moving. As you can see here, it takes us a certain amount of time to to travel. Like, nothing happens instantaneously in this game. So we are marching. We shall arrive... Predicted arrive on the 20th of April. He will not leave this territory in time. So we have pinned him to this territory. And we shall engage in glorious melee with him. And here's the fighting. As you can see, I'm just going to pause the game for a second. The way that fighting happens is here. Um, I'm not going to go into much detail because you can look about it up on the tutorial. On the tutorial missions in game. If you start, if you buy the game, I heavily recommend you play the tutorial mission in Ireland that explains all of this. Simple way is that you have the battle broken down into three phases. You have the maneuver phase, um, the combat phase, and then the retreat. And various factors are taken into account. As it stands, we are currently a better general. We have more men. And we are more aggressive when attacking, so we are winning the fight. As you can see, we have a plus two to our roll, so we are doing a nice ton of damage. We are in the early phase of the battle. One of our knights was killed, and for, well, we killed one of the enemy. Fantastic! Yes, one of our knights just rode in and just slaughtered him. Um, we wounded another. We wounded the enemy commander himself. Fantastic! And we have routed their forces gloriously, and we have captured a high-ranking uh, prisoner, who is. A member of his family, I think. Um, no, he's not. Yeah, he is. He's um, the son of the of the count that we are fighting. As you can see in the battle at the Battle of Lyon, um, we lost forty-seven men, but we killed seventy-nine. And he was wounded himself in battle. He lost one of his knights. So we are glorious this day. Unfortunately, we do not have enough men to actually to actually uh, take the settlement. Well, we do, but the fort level is quite high, so it will take us time, and that is unfortunate, and I do not want to wait around for that. So what I think we will do is I think we will use a bit of our prestige. If you right-click, you bring up an interactive tab which shows you what you can do with individuals, and we shall call them to war. It will cost us a lot of prestige. But at the same time, it will save us a lot of time and money. So we will call our allies into this war. He has joined us. Greetings, Petty King of Dumuff. Uh, we shall join you in this holy war. So come along, friend. Jump on. And in he comes. He is currently rallying his forces. It will take a little bit of time. Now we've got Vikings. Eight. Um, the current time period we're in 867 is basically like the main heyday of the Viking era. So expect to see a lot of Vikings running around causing mischief. As you can see, he is now rallying his forces. And we shall increase time slightly to average speed, just so that he can turn up and assist us. Um, we are losing troops, unfortunately, because while you are besieging, you suffer 1% attrition to your forces per month, which is not great. So... We'll just allow our allies to come in and assist us with taking Leon. Once Leon is taken, we shall think about what we want to do next. Um, our, our goal should really be to try and create the petty kingdom of Cornwall, um, just so that we protect ourselves against any inheritance problems that we have. Um, because the way inheritance works is that all your holdings are divided amongst your children currently. Because um, we have the lowest form of inheritance, and the highest title goes to your 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 heir. So we want to have a kingdom level title, so that we can prevent our territories from being divided too much. Um, because that would be bad, and the enemies would take advantage of us and destroy us in our sleep. 
Um, in comes our allies. And now we have a large amount of forces here, which will help us greatly reduce our time that it takes to besiege this place. Um, unfortunately, we do not have any siege equipment, so it's still going to take a while. A shady decision. Ooh, something is afoot at my court. Um, I am passing through the cast of the gardens for the morning walk when a soft breeze carries the voices of Willow and Burke to my ear. Um, well, sorry, Willow and Brucia. Um, two courtiers are talking to each other in a secluded spot nearby, frequent glancing around to make sure nobody is listening. While it is hard for me to make out most of what their words, from a distance it is clear that they are related to matters they are having a discussion related to Baron Un, your spy master. I must, I must warn Um, um We could do that, which gives us he gets he likes us more, but these people here will hate us. Um, we could, I could try, I could get a bit closer, but because we are honest, we would get stress from doing that action. Also, it is an intrigue challenge, which means we are likely to fail it because we are terrible at intrigue. Um, I must know what they are hiding, whatever the cost. We gain dread, which is a resource which basically we can use to intimidate people. Um, but it's a 50-50 chance that it will not help, will not occur. Oh, or we can go, uh, it's probably nothing important. Let us go. I'm going to go, we must warn Un. It will alienate them, but it will not drop them below positive. And it will make my spy master like me more, which is even better. So we have warned him there is skullduggery afoot. As that's happening, I should probably appoint my um, members of my counter to do stuff. He's getting money. He's getting me prestige. He's not particular. He's terrible at his job, unfortunately. His, his learning is so poor. Unfortunately, he, I can't replace him. Only the Pope can replace him. This guy's okay. Um, none of my... My counsel is terrible. Is there no one better at this? Okay, let's... He's my steward. Wasn't I... Oh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm engaged. I'm not married yet. Um, okay, let's look. Is there any better, anyone better... Okay, we can assign her as the steward. Okay. No, so I pressed the wrong button. Okay, let's... Okay. I think I've slightly messed up here. Okay, so she's got she's got that 10 and that 12. He's got 13 and 7. Okay, so yeah. we got to... Yes, so we've got to swap him. Reassign. Did she just disappear? Okay, there's something weird that's going on. Unless he can't be my steward. Which is unfortunate, because then I just lost a very good character. Yeah, it's got to do a quick manoeuvring of my court. Okay, so yeah, the character just literally just vanished. That was strange. So we have a bit more usefulness in my court, I suppose. But still, it's not a great court. Right. As I said, this game has... There are some mechanics. As I said, it is advisable for you to play the tutorial mission. The game is very, very good at teaching people how to play. Okay. So our siege of Leon, the capital of Leon, is coming along well. We are sieging... Yeah. The Brest. Brest. We're seeing Brest. The siege of Brest is coming along well. Um, in a few more months, we will have taken control. We can now betroth ourselves to the princess. <coughs> Sorry about that. Dry throat. One second. Sorry about that, folks. Anyway, we are back. Um, 
Yes, we can arrange our marriage, can go through. This is the strength of the alliance. He's vastly superior to us. So we don't want to anchor him. So we are now married to a princess of West Francia. Which are basically one of the kingdoms left over from the breakup of Charlemagne's empire. So yes. Our beautiful king. King Dumnarf has married his to married to Princess Glicia um Gisilia, Gisilia. As I said, my pronouncing names can be a bit spotty folks. And she is a lovely wife. And let us try to romance her, so she will be our soulmate. This will also give her the benefits of um, preventing her from plotting against us, because if she loves you, the likelihood of them being able to recruit to negative schemes against you is very, very low. Let us sing her a love poem. She will not be able to res resist our charms for long, so our king will be out there reciting poetry to his newly beloved. She now sits on our council as our wife, so she can give us benefits. So we can have a direct benefit, like she can affect one of our skills greatly, or we can take the average overall. I think I probably want to have the average overall. Plus one and everything except diplomacy and intrigue is pretty nice. As you can see, it boosts our skills up quite well. Um, but be that as it may, wedding celebrations. Okay, my marriage to Princess Gisilia. The realm expects us to throw a substantial extravagant wedding celebration. Um, it is well within my right to collect a royal aid duty. So we can either ask for money or let my subject enjoy the festivities without worries or care. We get prestige. 75 gold this early on in the game is very powerful, so we will take that. And time is ticking on. But let's just increase the speed a bit just to help with the siege. So we're boosting it up to them up to high speed. Ah, romance competition. As of late, my visits to Gisiel have, uh, have been ruined by my vassal, Baron Uni. He follows her everywhere like a lost puppy. He attempts to charm the lady. How dare he? A duel we will lose. Um, basically, we will lose that duel because he's better at it than we are. Uh, um... He would keep calling, trying to court my wife as well, the, um, the cad. Um, unfortunate case of food poisoning, um, we could do that. Um, unfortunately, both of these are against our natures, so we will get stressed. I think we will do, his love is not true, the coin will persuade him to stop, which is our best chance of success. He accepts the bribe to leave my wife alone. We do take a little bit of stress, unfortunately. But we did take the region. We captured some prisoners as well. Fantastic. So let's go back down to um, to low speed. We will take the we should take the peace because we are victorious. And to the abhorrent petty king Dumnarf, may your humours rot in your body. And in order to put an end to this bloodshed, we surrender. And there we go. Get some prestige. Get some devotion because it was a religious war. And uh, our further decreases, our religious um, Catholicism's further decreases because we won a holy war. And their further increases because they lost, which basically is how religiously upset they are. So here we go. We have taken over Leon. We have to disband our forces. And with the and this is telling us we can do stuff, we can fabricate, we can recruit some men at arms, which we will do. We can declare some more wars. We have powerful vessel vassals expecting uh, holdings. The bishop wants to be wants to be my marshal. My goodness, he can actually be my marshal. Sure. There you go. You're you're sick. You're unwell, and um, you're a religious zealot, and you are a bishop. But you will be my head of my armed forces. Well done, sir. Um, let's get him focused on training commanders so he buffs our, me our men at arms and our, our knights, which would be a good way of getting more troops into the kingdom. As it going, we're going to have this. We're going to have the clock ticking always by slowly, unless there's an event, because it just is a bit more realistic that way. 
Um, we will hire some men at arms. Early on, I find bowmen are very powerful since the game tends to pick up light footmen and bowmen counteract light footmen. Each man at arms type counters a different men at arms type. So let us pick up some bowmen. Um, we still have quite a bit of cash floating about. Um, and let us just pause quickly. I suppose we don't have to. Let us go to our prisoners in our dungeon. Is there anyone we can ransom for monies? Ah, something has happened. What has happened? Ah, our marshal left us. That is unfortunate. So we need the next best thing, which is we're going to put you back into your place of honour. Either he became imprisoned or just left our court. It is unclear. But hey, there we go. Let's look at our prisoners. Neither of them we can do anything with. We could execute them to get dread. But because we are honest and pious, we will basically take uh, take penalties. Um, is she good for anything? Learning. Neither of these people are good for anything. So let's just demand a conversion to Christianity. And he's already Christian, so we just let him go. And she converted to Christianity and left. Excellent. I could execute them to get dread. Uh, but I'm not really in the market for that at the moment. Um, oh, he is just terrible at his job. So poor. Um, I am tempted to murder him, to be honest. Um, also, we could probably want to convert this country to our culture. Um, the stability of a territory, as you can see here, is affected by the culture and the religion. So, to stop particular counties from rebelling against us, we want them to be of the same culture and religion as us. Um, romance. Unpleasant pleasantries. I am attending a dance in Exeter to spend some time with my wife. The mere thought of touching hands makes my heart jump, but when I arrive I find her stuck in a conversation with my vassal again. Um, I will take her place better, better that I suffer than her. We will gain a lot of stress. Um, you get a headache. Enough, you are boring the lady to death. You'll lose prestige. You go close to forming a rivalry of him. No, let's go. I'm not going anywhere close to that man. My wife will just have to put up with him. Um, because as it stands, we have a 100% chance of success. Now, where can we expand into? Nowhere really. At the moment, we could go into Ireland. They are not... No, we can't. They're ca they're, they are a member of the Christian faith, so we can't do a holy war. Uh, these guys have got a lot of troops still, unfortunate. Um, he hasn't got a ton, but he is allied to France. What do we need to get the founding the petty kingdom of Cornwall? Um, so we just need money. We just need 300 gold, realistically speaking. Um, we also need to be ex um, exalted amongst men or above which is if we see here level of fame it's pretty high um, so we it's a while off before we can form the petty kingdom of Cornwall well before we can form the true kingdom of Cornwall um, but for the time being I think what we do need to do is going to pause quickly is though he endorses us he, he is terrible so we probably need to kill him Unfortunately, it's not likely going to happen. We have no agents to support us, um, which is unfortunate. So, as it stands right now, we will have to find some way of expanding our territory. Um, unfortunately, if we do fabricate claims on counties, you can see here possible side effects. We're just going to get negative effects, which means vassal opinion is lost, loss of piety, upsets the target. It's not great. Um, but we do need to start expanding and getting territory to help us build up our empire. Otherwise, we are going to be in trouble. Um, so I think what we should do is probably start expanding into Wales. So I'm going to take him. You're going to go there. It's going to take us five years to develop a good Casus Belli against him, which is basically the writ that we use to press our claim. And this would be a good place, I think, to leave it for the time being, with our start-off into the formation of the Great Kingdom of Cornwall. 
Um, we have taken we've taken Leon. We have taken um, Breston here, and um, we all start to foment our little empire while keeping ourselves protected from the dark and dastly powers of the Northmen to coming across the North Sea. It is a dark time indeed for for, Eng for Britain, I should say. We are not English, we are Cornish. How dare I even have those words in the same sentence? And I shall see you all again next time, folks. Goodbye.